Okay, tell you what, we'll do one more thing. Uh, Doug, are you there? Okay, we'll catch up with Doug later. Okay, let's go and get started, three after the hour. Um, okay, so I don't need to nag about AIs. I don't think there's anything too exciting on the AIs other than I, I did nag Clemens earlier. He had some things on his list, so he promised we could work on that. Um, community time, is there anything from the community people would like to bring up? Okay. Moving forward then, SDK. We did just have a call uh, previous to this one about the SDK updates. Um, small attendance, not a whole lot to mention there other than for those of you who are watching the Golang SDK, uh, Scott is working with uh, the VMware guys to do some sort of harmonization because there were sort of two SDKs floating around there for a period of time. And they're, they're working hard to see if they can sort of bring those together. And uh, it seems like they're making some good progress there. Um, Scott, is there anything you want to mention about that? I could use some eyes on my code. So sure. if, if someone is, um, or if someone has used the Go, the current Golang SDK to develop something and you would like to try out my new version, let me know. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, I think that's it for the SDK update. Are there any questions or concerns you want to raise? Okay. Um, let's see, next demo proposal. So we had a meeting last Monday, or, or this, yeah, this Monday, and we're gonna have another one next Monday. Um, Scott, would you like to give a quick update on where we are with the demo ideas? Uh, so the, the, we took some time and thought about exactly what we wanna demo instead of the concept of the mechanics of the demo and more of what, what the demo will show. And so we're kind of working through that piece and if you scroll up, there's a section on, I think the very top section. Uh, yeah. So we, we're trying to show the power of standardization. So like what, what things that does cloud events let you do today that is, or today that's hard that cloud events may make easier. And so we're, we're gonna show the SDKs and the uh, maybe transport bindings. So middleware that allows different transports to connect, which is uh, potentially new for this demo that we didn't show last time because it was all HTTP based. And we're gonna try to show observability. So the uh, maybe the tracing or tracking ID extension so that we could see events flow through multiple systems, through multiple transports and uh, details TBD. And then a side goal is uh, we can we can continue to use this demo idea in the future so we don't have to rewrite it every time. Yep. All right. Any questions for Scott? Okay. Um, obviously, um, love to have more people involved in this. Um, uh, the more people we get involved, uh, the sooner the better. Just makes everybody can support it and get you know, some really cool ideas out there. The more people the we have the better ideas we usually come up with. All right, um, moving forward then, KubeCon planning. So we did have a call last week, I believe, and we're having another one right after this one to talk about what we we're gonna discuss during an intro and deep dive. I believe the current planning is, the intro is gonna have our standard, you know, what are we, what are our goals and stuff like that and general information. And that's only gonna take, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes at most kind of a thing. Um, but then use the rest of the time to talk about um, some things that might be more broader interest, things like, you know, the SDKs, perhaps do a demo around the SDKs and stuff like that. And then a deep dive, we'll do exactly that. We'll go deeper into things um, like lessons learned, stuff like that. We're still kind of working out the details, like, for example, talking about, you know, maybe a more advanced hello world kind of thing, that we, you know, or a very simple hello world in the intro, and then a more advanced one in the deep dive, that kind of stuff. Um, Probably the most interesting thing though is originally when I submitted the request for us to have an intro and deep dive, I thought that having just those two sessions, which are 35 minutes each, should be sufficient for uh, everything that we're doing, meaning not just cloud events, but also the serverless working group itself. Based upon the discussion last week though, uh, we kind of realized that maybe what we should do is have a serverless dedicated session, uh, just one session and, and make it an 80 minute one as opposed to two 35 minutes and kind of turn it into a little bit of a birds of a feather type session as well. So talk a little bit about the state of serverless since we put out the white papers, perhaps even update the white papers in the landscape doc, 
but then kind of turn it around and get input from the community in terms of where they perhaps would like to see us go in terms of other areas of work they might want to focus on and stuff like that and just basically make it a little bit more interactive. So I did put in a request for that, um, for that second, or for, I'm sorry, for the additional session just for the service working group. And I think we are going to get it. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. So we're going to continue our talks, like, um, as I said, after this call. And we'll try to fill out the details of what we'll talk about in the serverless session. But I did want you guys on the call to be aware that we are planning this third session and not just the intro and deep dive for cloud events. All right. Um, anybody from that list want to mention something that I may have forgotten? OK, any questions? All right, cool, moving forward then, PRs. So, um, Rachel, I don't think anything's changed with your PR, and I think we're on hold because Clemens was gonna put down some ideas that he was talking about on last week's call. Is that the current status? That's my understanding also. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't do uh... that. Okay. No, I guess, don't worry about it. Yeah, no problem, not a problem. If, um, but also other people add in comments too. A few people message me privately, that's fine. But if you want to like chime in in public and say like, here's what I would like to see out of this, that would be great too. Definitely agreed with that, yes. I'd love to get more conversations in the PRs and issues themselves. Yep. All right, so do we, anybody have any questions or comments like to bring up on Rachel's PR before we move on? All right, moving forward then, Christoph. I'm trying to remember where we were on this one. I think, actually, with Christoph, are you able to talk, even though you're on the train, Christoph? Uh, I can try. Okay. It's just a little background noise here, maybe. So mute me if it's too much. Yeah, it's not. It's not that bad. Okay. All right. Um, so I also don't see a screen, so I don't really know where you are. I think in the last calls we discussed a lot of things and uh, we addressed all concerns. Um, so I guess this is sort of ready to get approved or not. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Okay. So just to refresh everybody's memory, I believe on last week's call, the direction we decided to head was to change the must to a should and decrease the size down to 46, I'm sorry, 64K. Uh, I don't think, I think the rest of it is fairly much the same as before. It's just basically general guidance on how to measure things and stuff like that. But so that's that first paragraph, that's really the key. So given that, what do people think? Do people still like this general direction? Do I need to start calling on people? Who wants to speak up? Okay, also I'm gonna start calling on people based on who has spoken up in the past. Um, let's start with Rachel. I think you've had an opinion on this one in the past. You okay with this? Yeah, I think this is fine. I like. Mm, I thought that we were supposed to use this past week to see if like, do we have any qualms with this? Like, does this not, can any, is this not okay with anyone's system? Um, I did not personally do that, but I think I have reason to believe this is gonna be fine no matter what. So I like, I am personally fine with this. Okay, yeah, I think I did put a comment in there asking people to, to look it over and if they have comments to, to raise it either in the PR or on today's call. So Scott, your hands up. I, I, so my work with the Go SDK, I've, I've realized that one of the things that the, this specification is missing is the uh, content encoding strategy like Base64 or gzipped or whatnot. And, and that would really dramatically change the over the wire message size. There is a discussion about that. I think Alan raised that as a um, as a concern. There's an issue about, issue for this. Yeah, I, I commented on that uh, maybe a couple days I, ago. Yeah, I think it's yes. this one, right? Yes, 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 yes. And and we was that me? Was it on me to write that PR? Um, it was kind of implied, but if you don't do it, <laughs> or if, if, if you don't have time to do it. Um, yeah, if you, if, you don't, if you don't have time to do it, it might be good to say so in the issue itself so someone else can uh, okay. take it up. Yeah, no, since, since, I'm, since I apparently have a huge heap of homework, um, I can just do, because that one is, is relatively easy. I, okay. see. I, I, feel, I feel guilty and that in front of all these fine people. 
<laughs> and you should feel guilty. I like that. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm really sorry. It's just that. Okay. Yeah, actually, that, that one is, is actually of interest to me because I think that's kind of an important one. Um, yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Okay, so cool. Thank you. Yeah, so, so that, will, that will address this issue. Effectively, the content encoding is, is going to be echoing what um, HTTP does. Um, and that then basically describes this is basically for encoded, and uh, that could also obviously fit that you have uh, GZIP encoding or whatever. So basically, I think that section is going to steal straight from HTTP. Okay, but let's circle back again to Scott, your comment. Um, do you think that this, that there are different encoding schemes, as you said, it might impact the size of things? Is are you suggesting that? 64K may not be the right size, or you just bring it up as something to think about? You know, I'm, I'm not concerned about the size. I, I think it's just the, for example, if you base 64 and code something, it becomes bigger because uh -huh. it's, it's more bytes. So the representation that the message is uh, before encoding for JSON format is not a potentially an accurate way to measure the over the wire size of this message. Oh, I see what you're saying. Is that, hmm, is, is, hmm, is that something that you'd like to see addressed in this PR or follow-on PR, or is it something you're not sure we need to? I, I don't know if it's a, a, a real issue. It's just like looking at the text could be inaccurate, uh, like in a technical point. So, uh, can I ask a question? So I wrote this big uh, third part or the last paragraph uh, where I'm trying to describe that it's the over the wire size doesn't matter what matters is like sort of uh, we try to measure it independently just only the crowd event and for that we use the JSON format but it's just for measuring it the over the wire from uh, size doesn't really matter because it will be different depending on which format we use um, does that paragraph not make sense or am I missing something well, I think there's two forms of the JSON format that the message could be sitting in. There's the, the encoded version, um, and then there's the decoded version, and those sizes could be very different. Okay, so I, we should, well, basically the text then should uh, say which one it is, and then the problem is solved, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that something? Thing you guys would like to see as part of this PR or follow on PR? How would you guys like to work that? In, in general, it should be, we should be talking only about the wire size because that's, that's what matters. And maybe, maybe the, 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 the discussion of mini of minified is maybe a little much here, like from a personal taste. Um, because, you know, it's, it's that big, and if you have in your encoding mechanisms to go and make it less big, well then go use that. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure we. It's. It seems. It seems a little strange and a little wordy here for what we're trying to express. Like we want to say the wire. The wire size of the encoded message, uh, you know, should be uh, uh, should accept up to a size of 54 kb. Um, and there's a lot of extra wording here that might not be necessary. So, okay, I'm trying to figure out how to make progress here because this issue has been out there for a while and, and I don't know whether Christoph is feeling frustrated or not. That It just, from my point of view, this, this thing's been out there for a while and, and, and we need to sort of figure out some way to wrap this up without letting it linger on too long. Um, and Clemens, you're, you're now suggesting that perhaps we shouldn't be talking about this mimification kind of thing. It's rather just, you know, what are the bytes on the wire, period, right? Yeah, I, 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 since, since this is normative text, um, I think the, the, normative, the normative thing is effectively uh, the first sentence up to the comma. And the rest is, an ex the rest is mostly uh, example implementation hint. Well, well, sort of, other than it does use normative you know, RFC keywords and stuff. Um, yeah. And it does talk about, you know, using the, the JSON format to figure out the size. So it's not just. You know, but it's like, it. it's like if you use Cbor, 
Well, so let me, let me do this because Christoph has put a lot of work into this and he, he typically only seems to get feedback on the call itself for the most part, which is, I, from my perspective, if I was in his shoes, I'd be kind of frustrated having to wait a week before every little comment comes in. So, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah so I'm trying to figure out the, um, so I, I, I don't, I feel like I have to say this, but I don't want to because Clemens, you already have a lot on your plate, but if, if you're suggesting an alternative here, could you write that up so people can look at it and compare it? Cause I don't want to sit there and say, Hey, Christoph, can you go do Clemens idea? It's not fair to him. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Basically there's a, there's a, I understand what the thought process here is of the measured by serializing the cloud event as Jason. Right. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not happy with that. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't want to rush. Not, it's not clear. It's not clear to me that on, on a particular route, we go and, and re-serialize and re-serialize the event so much and that kind of normalizing on JSON helps us so much. Um, let me, I'll, I'll put that on my homework list. I'll, okay. I'll write something up. Okay, it's not going to be substantially different. I think there's just a, bit, a little bit too much of, 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 um, focus on particular aspects of JSON. Like it should be self-explanatory that you throw out, that you don't do a pretty print formatting um, for JSON. Okay. Okay, so so Christoph, are, are, it sounds like there's at least a little bit of concern between Scott and Clemens that maybe the wording isn't quite right here. I, I assume you're okay with with this being delayed a little bit. I don't think it's critical that, that this gets in, but we're also not asking you to do any work to modify this. I want someone else to, to put forward a slightly modified proposal then we, that we can consider. Is that fair with you? Yeah. Um, I tried to, uh, I didn't catch everything 100%, but I tried to uh, listen to what Clement said. And maybe if I get it, I can also make a proposal if Clement doesn't have time. Uh, okay. But I, gener I, I mean, I'm happy to make changes. Uh, well, yeah, the time frame is a little bit uh, accelerated than what it is now that we're right. Yeah. Okay. What I'll do is but other than that, like if you drop me, yeah. Yeah, what I'll do is I put, I, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go into a different PR. I'm gonna go and, and effectively write down a suggestion into the into the PR in the comments, and then um, and then you'll see whether whether that's okay or not. So basically, I'm I'm gonna write an alternative version of this section, but I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna put that into the comments of this of this PR. Yeah, please do not open up a separate PR. We don't want dueling PRs. I'd rather have the like a modified proposal text kind of a thing yes. as part of this one that way so that's what yeah we'll yeah okay 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 excellent thank you guys very much okay cool and and first off thank you very much for your patience and work on this one i really appreciate it no worries okay um any other questions or comments on this one all right cool thank you guys moving forward um the data ref one i know Christoph, you made a minor update here, but that wasn't actually what we were really blocked on. So let me just quickly show that minor update. Hold on a sec. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, Are I you... added, um, Casey had some questions. I think there were some valid, and I made this uh, edit as one sentence that should be, should clarify that data and data ref. The information behind it must always be exactly the same, must be identical. So that was sort of confusing before maybe, and now it should be really clear. Right, I see that, and I'm highlighting on the screen for people. Um, but I believe the action item from this one that was supposed to be done was, Clemens, you had some concern about uh, potentially doing this same type of thing, but without adding another attribute called data ref, possibly reusing data itself. Yeah, yeah, that was that would have been, would have been effectively, and that's an implementation. It's, instead of doing that, Put an implementation node in. I'm, I'm so I'm okay. I'm okay with the text as it's written. As it's written. Um, I'm just not sure we need to have that attribute. But that's something that um, I'll uh, the that's something that the majority should really just go and decide. Um, I, I think it's a little. I, I think that extra attribute is something that we can also do, as you know, that can be an element in the payload. But I also see the, 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 the advantage of having something that's generic. So that a generic, generic implementation could potentially go and then pull the, uh, um, you know, the data from the reference place um, and then kind of present the event as if it was flowing all the way through um, as one. 
Um, so I, I could see I could see both sides. Right, but I think you were you had the action item to go off and and try to write down what you were actually thinking as an alter, as a slightly alternative proposal here. Right? Ah, yeah, that, that, um, that's what I was getting to. Oh, yeah, yeah. This this is a terrible call for me. Okay. <laughs> I know we're, we're picking on you big time. Yes. So, uh, Tapini, your hands up. Yeah, I just uh, not totally the same, but similar to Clemens's uh, thing. The only thing I'm worried here is. Um, if all if this is part of the main spec, are all implementations uh, like thought to have this? I believe the intention was that it is part of the main spec, but it would be optional. I'm trying to figure out whether that optionality means optional to sub to use or optional to support as a receiver. No, it, um, it's meant to be optional as a, I mean, as a receiver, you, you, if you get this data ref, so, ba so basically my attention is, um, someone does not want to send the full data payload. And then I would add the data ref. And then as a receiver, if you have someone who would send that or a middleware in between that would change your event, then yes, you have to support it. Uh, but if you're a middleware, you can just forward it and you don't really have to do anything about it if you don't want to. Yeah, so, yeah but say I have an API that accepts cloud events. And I need data because what I need is in the data. Am I compliant if I reject um, events with data ref instead of data because my implementation doesn't support it? Well, I would say yes, because the data ref doesn't really, is not, it's not always meant that you are able to uh, get the data from there. So for example, if you have these uh, more security focused patterns uh, where only a specific uh, receiver who has a pre-shared secret should access the data, um, then you as a generic consumer cannot uh, read the data ref. So that's a case where I think you're still in sort of compliance if you just consume the event but don't do anything with it. But that's obviously not very helpful for your use case. There actually might be a broader question here about, as a receiver, must it support all the, but might, must it support the semantics of every single property or can it reject a message because it doesn't support it and still be compliant? But um, Tam, I think you had your hand up for a sec. Did, did you want to ask something? Oh, no, I, I was going to mention the, the same sort of things where the data payload may not be visible and it might be convenient for the, you know, the data ref to be there. So it was covered. Okay. Okay. Um, so Tapini, did you get your question answered? Well, yes, with another question, not an answer. <laughs> That's kind of helpful. Well, I, Personally, I would almost rather wait until we sort of uh, nail down what the final proposal looks like before we try to answer that question. Because for example, let's say we come back with a proposal um, that says, okay, we don't need data ref. We can do this, this claim check thing using just the data attribute. I don't think there's any doubt that everybody must support the data attributes in general. The question is then, do they need to support this claim check pattern that's encoded within the data attribute and we can decide the optionality of that when, when that comes up. Oh. Well, well, actually that answered my question in the sense that it's not answered because <laughs> the, well, I, I guess what I'm asking is or requesting is that it's made more clear whether it is inside, inside the data or the data ref attribute, whether it's optional to support this at all, like, are you still in compliance? Because it's not clear in the text right now. I think, so Christoph, correct me if I'm wrong because you're on a train, but I think you said it would be, it would be a compliance implementation if the receiver rejects the message if it doesn't support claim check. Um, well, <laughs> um, I want to say this. 
I don't know what exact what exactly you mean with reject. So you would say I cannot process this event, but what what is supposed to happen at this point? I mean, you you get events, and either you understand them or you don't. And in this case, for some reason, you don't. But this can happen for any sort of reason, like the uh, sender introduces a new type of event, and you don't understand this event. There will be another case where you can't process the events, right? Or maybe I'm on a uh, wrong wrong track. I don't know. Depending. I, I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, sort of. <laughs> so it's interesting to me. I mean, for me, it's sort of. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. So for me, is uh, you you get an event, and either you can consume it or you can't. So one of the reasons you can't consume this because you don't understand um, how to get that thing out of the data ref. But there may be other reasons why you can't consume it. Um, what, I, what I don't understand is what you exactly mean reject because who understands what is rejecting? What, what do you expect from you rejecting the, uh, the event that's going to happen? That's a valid question. I guess I'll be in draw more like, but yeah, sure. I, I get your viewpoint. I don't have an answer for you yet. Okay. What's the rule? What are the rules for for visibility of that location? What What's your thinking so, here? Because yeah. it could be it could since we're since we're ultimately cloud events is a messaging path, and that may go through uh, routers and may go um, you know across networking across network boundaries, which means you might quite well um, have a scenario where you come out of a private network environment. Um, on the edge, and then you transition into a cloud environment, and then you transition back into a VNet. And now you have a cloud event, and you have a data ref, and that data ref is now pointing to something that sits over in that private network at the edge. How does that yeah, work? So, um, my view on that is it kind of is similar to what we have with this. Uh, schema URL or even the source, which are also uh, URI references. There is no guarantee necessarily well, because they can be relative or they can be also absolute, but there is no guarantee that you can actually access um, this URI. Yeah, but those are um, different. And is, a schema URI, and a schema URI is typically a pointer to your cache, even though it might be, it, there might be a real location. Source is very clearly only an abstract identifier. Um, and so both of those are just URIs. But here, I, I think you literally need to have a URL because you need to go and get at that data that's being pointed to. Well, then. So you would have to define a rule. You have to go and, and, and write down a rule here that, that speaks about the relationship of you know publisher and consumers, and that they have to have visibility to this because he, the data is an integral part of that message, and what you're doing is you're basically you're you're uh, pushing that off to a different place, but it needs to be assured that anybody who receives that event is able to uh, consume the entirety of that event in some way. Okay, so so that is an assumption that we can make, and then I can change the text in the message. I didn't make uh, in the spec. I didn't make this assumption. Um, what a, one assumption I made is that similar to encryption, you may encrypt the message and make sure that only um, a pre-selected set of consumers can decrypt the message. Right? That is one use case we may want to support, and sort of this one here will be similar to encryption. You don't encrypt it, but you put uh, the data into the data ref and you don't tell anyone how to basically get there because they need a secret for example so you get this message or this event either you have the secret you can access it or you don't have it you can't and that, that would and be one why, use case yeah, yeah and, and that's that's yeah. exactly why I'm, why, I'm, why I'm like if this is in the data in the data payload then you already then you have an, a constrained audience which understands what that data payload is and can then go and, 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 and agree on 
what the what the specific semantics are of attributes that are in the in the data of that particular event, which may include, you know, being able to go and, and get at, at particular data items that are too big to include, or um, um, you know, objects, pictures that are being referenced, whatever, um, with alternate representations um, um, of some sort. And that's that's something like if you have the we started we started with our first uh, demos were like the um, you know the blob created event for for storage, and they all point to to images that are too large if you would not include in that event. And and but that's a that's a claim check, that's a claim check pattern implementation arguably um, that then is fairly specific for the particular cloud storage system because they're all somewhat different. Um, and uh, so in that de in the interop demo that we did, we had three different cloud storage services or four. And so the implementations have basically got um, the, the respective events. They could generically figure out, you know, where does that come from? What's the source of this? And what's the event type? And based on that, they could go and dispatch into um, a, a handler that could then go and extract the, 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 the image uh, according to what what kind of event that was, but there is always some idiosyncrasies to the, the, the particular storage services, and and that's all encoded in uh, effectively that in that event payload, and that has worked. But I find I, I, you're proposing you're proposing a super generic mechanism, right? But at the same time, there seem to be a ton of exceptions for it, that that then require kind of a negotiation amongst uh, um, a, um, a set of, uh, of consumers and producers. And, and so I'm wondering how generic that me me mechanism really can be. Okay, so I mean, there, right. I tried to make it very generic. That was my first approach, but it's completely well to make a really concrete approach and say, okay, it has to be an HTTP URL, it has to be public, has to be accessible from anywhere. That kills out a few use cases, but it makes sort of everything else easier, I'd say. But it also means basically that the data is then always on the public internet. That's the downside, and I'm not sure if everyone would be well, happy with that. I don't know. That's the that's what I see as the trade off in that approach, and also that you can't then go and use to say the Azure Blob Storage. Uh, it probably also has some HTTP URL, but you can't uh, use the native access method for it. But I guess I'm a little confused. Clemens, were you actually suggesting that we get as prescriptive as? What Christoph was saying there, things like the URL has to be publicly available. I can't imagine that, but that's going to work for everybody. No, but there there has to be there it, there has to be a rule that says, um, or there has to be at least mention of um, you know, that the consumers and publishers must share the same. Um, uh, basically, both need to be able to see um, the, the the data ref um, where the data ref points to. Within a given system, obviously, right? Does public, right? But the 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 text that I highlighted on the screen um, that Christoph put into the thing, where it says the location may not be accessible without further information, such as a shared secret or something like that, I interpreted that as, you know, there are maybe environmental concerns or details that you need to work out before you can actually talk to that URL, but that's something that we can't necessarily specify in the spec. Do you think? Yeah, that. But that's that's. I think that. Um, I find that a little weak for for that for that particular for that particular concern, and that is so. So here, when I read this, I would think about, oh yeah, of course you need to have some some credentials, um, but it's it's really like because of the complication comes in because we we might be propagating cloud events across system boundaries, and it's not clear that once this consumer gets that event, that it then in turn has access to the particular location at all. Uh, that's a little different than it may not be ex accessible without further information because if that object is is sitting somewhere in the system on the edge, you might not be able to get it at all at all. Like there's no path. So 
Well, okay, I'm trying to figure out whether you think that there's a fundamental flaw here or it's just a matter of the wording isn't quite what you'd like to see. It's, um, for a generic, so I think for a generic mechanism needs to be, it needs to be cl made clear that the publisher and the consumer might sit in, might be in different, in different, uh, you know, networking scopes and that you have to pay attention to that. Okay. So I, I want to have it more explicit. Okay. So you, you'd like to see some more general guidance at some point. That's right. Okay. And, um, and then, and then the, um, the last cl clause here, if this attribute is used, the information should be accessible long enough that that is arguably, uh, how, 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 how long I want to go and store that is not the specs business. Right. Okay. So it sounds like basically what you're saying is there may be some additional information that may be appropriate for say a primer for additional guidance around this stuff because the spec can't be too prescriptive. Yeah. But the, there may be primer material here somewhere is basically what you're saying. And that's, yeah. that's fine. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, but it also sounds like you're not necessarily against in principle, this idea of a code check. It's just the exact syntactical format of it is something you think may be better done through use of the data attribute. Right. Yeah, I, I keep, I, I still believe that data attribute is the better place for it and the better place for it because um, um, you might have, it, you might have more information than, than you can put into this one field here or into this one URL and you might have, you might have one event may actually carry multiple references to external data right. uh, and not just one. Right. And, okay. and then you're ending up, and then you're ending up in the situation where you have some of those are sitting in data with external references, and then you kind of end up with the corner cases being able to use this data ref thing. Right. Okay. So I think though, in terms of next steps here, uh, you have an action item to write up your slightly modified idea here for how to solve this particular problem, and you're going to write that up as a comment in this issue or in this PR. Um, the the other aspect though is i guess it's the one that tapini was bringing up which is what does optional mean in this particular case and is something is that something we need to think about once we agree on the exact mechanism that we're going to potentially add to the spec because i'm i'm not 100 percent sure that everybody's on the same page about what optional means for this particular feature and possibly even for the entire spec in general as a receiver um so what I'd like to do is I'll, I'll take the action item to open up an issue just so we don't lose track of this to make sure we revisit it. Cause I do think it's an important one because I do think understanding the optionality of all our properties are, is very important to make sure you understand who's responsible for supporting it and when they can not support things. Um, and I just want to make sure that's very clear. So I'll take the action item to open up an issue to discuss that. But so Clemens, if you can write up your modified proposal as a, as a comment in this PR, Yes, sir. Relative, relatively soon, so people can think about it before next week's call. I'd, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I will. I will do as much homework as I can tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there other aspects related to this PR that people would like to bring up? Uh, okay, um, I think you know. I think this was a reference. I think it's a it's a good feature. But as an event consumer, uh, if there's such a reference. Um, so the event consumer does not need to go deep into the data payload, can just get the information from this reference. Um, but with regard to uh, uh, Clement's other comments about this, um, the, the type, um, I think probably we can um, work a little bit more on that because uh, I'm not sure whether um, the URI can represent all the locations that um, the payload is saved. I'm not sure about that. Interesting. To tell you what, Kathy, um, because I think what I think what you're concerned about there is almost a tangential issue to the mechanism of how to represent this um, in the message or in the event itself. Could you think about? what you'd want to use instead of a URI. And when you think of what you want that to be, can you add that as a comment into the PR itself? Yeah, okay, I can add that. But I, I myself, I don't know how to 
you know, what other types. And um, also whether, you know, um, like Clement mentioned before, um, if, there are, if the information is, is stored in several places, different types, how we are going to represent this? Is, this, is a single URI enough or we need to have a list of that? I would assume Clemens' proposal would address at least the part of that already. Okay, that's good. That, okay, so uh, the if there's a list of the um, URI or something like that. Okay. Yeah, but 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 it sounds like your concern is whether URI is the appropriate type, and I I think that's the first time that that question has been brought up. So if you think there is another type other than URI that might be appropriate to represent the location of the data. I think it'd be useful if you could uh, put, the, put a suggestion for what you'd like to use other than URI. Mm, okay. okay, I'll think about it. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. Because if there is something better, I'm not sure if we were against it, we just, URI seems to be the things most people's minds default to, so. Okay. Anything else related to this one people want to discuss? All right, cool. In that case, again, uh, Christoph, thank you very much for your patience and work on this one. I know this one's not, not easy, um, but we appreciate the effort you put into moving it forward. Uh, Tapini, deprecation. I don't think we've actually talked about this one yet. I'm not, I can't remember for sure. I think I might've mentioned it on last week's call since you were, I don't think, on the call. Do you want to talk to this one and give a summary of what you're thinking here? Uh, sure. So there was an issue opened by someone, I have no recollection who, uh, about how to signal deprecation of events or delivery methods or well, anything, I guess. And uh, there was a discussion where some ideas were thrown around. And I think Doug and I and someone else also basically said that, yeah, it would be cool to see a uh, signal deprecation on, on the wire, but uh, we don't want to prescribe too much specifics beforehand because it can be the need and the use case for deprecation can be quite varied from use case to use case. So I wrote up this as a draft of what I think should be the direction, as I think it would be valuable to have an extension to standardize the single application so consumers can, for example, alert an operator to react, even if they don't know how to handle the specifics of the single or the contents of this attribute. There are some comments I haven't addressed, and I apologize. I've been quite busy for a few weeks. Okay. And just to be clear for everybody, this is uh, a proposed extension, not a formal property inside the specification. So the bar for adding it is definitely lower than a full-fledged or first-class property. All right. Any questions for Tapini? Has anybody had a chance to really look at this? Okay. Nobody raise their hand, I'll, I'll ask a question. It, um, it's not clear to me what the values would be for these two properties. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I... Description here almost sounds like a Boolean. I mean, yes, that, as, as I was trying to describe, that is kind of the idea. That's why I've been laughing at trying to come up with an example because I don't really want to make an example. I'm just, because I think it's in, it's valuable as an extent. This is why I don't want it in the main spec, by the way. I think it's valuable to have somewhere to look at for deprecation that you're not going to get these events anymore. Let's say you're listening to a GitHub pull request version one events. They eventually, 10 years from now, decide to discontinue the delivery of those events because it's a legacy system. It, to me, it's quite valuable to know that if I look at deprecated field, I can know something's up with an event. I'm not going to get that anymore at some point. Uh, but how to signal that? I, I don't quite believe I know how to answer that question. And I, I kind of agree very, 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 very much with your viewpoint in the issue that we even shouldn't be describing that. 
and that's why it's intentional left so open ended. Well, what I was kind of yeah, uh, I apologize. I, what, I, what I was kind of wondering was whether it needs to be actually split across two properties. Whether you could yeah. just have a deprecated string, and the fact that the property is there at all means it's deprecated, and the string just tells you some human readable description of why it's going away, where to look for a replacement, that kind of stuff, and that's sort of producer defined. But you could sure. probably encapsulate all that within just a single property. That that's completely fine with me. Uh, as I said, I'm not heavily invested in anything that's in the proposal. The deprecated type was, I included it because it was an idea that might help someone because if we prescribe nothing, it's basically a Boolean. I wanted to encourage um, someone developing a more sophisticated use, I think, uh, than Boolean for the field, but I'm completely fine with removing it and just letting it play out. I'm sure someone will come up with something more useful anyway. I was thinking more in the line of a URL that will link to an explanation of the deprecation in the deprecated field, for example, as the most simple use case. Were you just, were, were you thinking of at some point, perhaps information in these two fields could be used to programmatically figure out how to fix things like, something in there would tell you, okay, this field's going away, but maybe in the future it's, it's called this instead and, and people should be able to programmatically analyze that and make some changes on the receiving side as a result, or is that too sort of AI-ish? Well, yes, along those lines, for example, if you're going to deprecate an extension, um, that's, how, how would you do that in the future? I, I guess the deprecated type actually now that we discuss it doesn't add that much value. Um, I think the main point I'm looking for is the fact that it's just signaled and you can find more information somewhere. Yeah. Having the information encoded actually doesn't make that much sense anymore to me. If someone comes up with a good, good way to do that, I guess they'll use the field for that anyway, since it's left open-ended. Right. Okay. So yeah, that, that actually sounds fine with me. I'll remove it unless someone has an objection. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on this one? Let me ask this question. What do people think about this as an extension at all? Is there any objection to even continuing down this path? Or does someone think, nope, this is a complete mistake, even as an extension, they don't want it at all? Okay, I just want to make sure that there's, oh, go ahead, sorry. We can always deprecate the deprecation extension. <laughs> You've been dying to say that, haven't you? Uh, okay, well, like, like, as, like we all know, right? Um, extensions are meant to be sort of experimental in some way, so if this goes nowhere, then eventually may it die, that's fine. It's not like it's a version change for us if we, if we drop it later, it's just an extension. I, I, find, I find that question very interesting, though. Can you? What, deprecate the deprecated flag? Yeah. I suppose you could, <laughs> but it's not, you don't actually, you don't, but you don't use this to deprecate flags or properties. You use this to deprecate events, uh, right? No, no, read it through it. You oh, can you did I? deprecate any freaking thing you want. Oh, I missed that. I apologize. That is part of the intentionally open end. You can use it to indicate anything you want. Oh, you're messing with my head now. So Clemens, my, let, let me say to you, uh, yes, of course you can deprecate it. If you don't want to have a deprecated attribute, i.e. you don't want to signal the removal of features in any way, then why not deprecate an extension? Okay. If, if you're not gonna be cons considering deprecation or removal of features in any way at all, you don't wanna be involved with it, I don't think it's uh, in any way expected of you to not be deprecating extensions. I like that idea. But doesn't the sentence that I highlighted where it says the deprecated attribute indicates deprecation of the event delivery, doesn't that kind of imply the entire thing? Okay, that, so that's a mistake on my part. I, I, was, I, I was very challenged uh, by trying to come up with, an, with a sentence to describe deprecating anything. So that was the best I came up with, but oh, wow. now that you say that, I'm, I guess that isn't very clear. I never think about that one. That's a mind-boggling concept. 
because that that can that can that could be actually quite complicated after a while. Um, That's why I'm saying we need to leave it open ended. We we <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Huh? Okay. Thank you, Scott, for completely blowing my mind. Anything else you guys want to talk about this one? It sounds like more thinking may need to be done here. Um, yeah, I'm also going to work on that. Yeah. The language and remove the deprecated type and throw in an example of, you know, a URL linking to a blog that explains why this event was deprecated. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last chance. Any questions or comments on this one? All right. Um, technically, we're at the end of the main agenda, and I don't think we have a whole lot of time to go into anything too deep. Um, Clemens already got a nagging reminder about that one. Oh, this one. I just want to mention. Uh, there's an issue out there about the scope of the of the ID of events. Um, I think we say it has to be unique, but we don't formally say the scope of it. Like, or actually, maybe I'm sorry. I think we say within the scope of the producer. Um, but then there was a question about. Uh, should we basically be more formal and say source plus identifier, the, the, the combination of those two fields needs to be, for example, global unique or something like that. I wanted to, I don't mind writing up a proposal for that and taking the, the lead on trying to push something through if we want to, but I wanted to get a sense from the group. Do you guys in general agree that source plus ID needs to be global unique or is there some other sort of, um, uh, mechanism you guys were thinking of to determine uniqueness for these things. I think that's right. Okay. That, that's, that's impossible to guarantee. Yeah, I, I was going to say I don't really like that idea. So again, okay, like, well, God, we're running out of time. So let me quickly, Scott, can you, can you explain, I'll elaborate a little on why you think that's impossible to guarantee? We, because, well, um, there's, there is no, there's guidance on what source can be, but there's nothing that says that it's uh, like a resource pointer. And there's guidance on you uh, ID, but there's it could be a sequence number if you really wanted to and still be compliant with the spec. So I could ha have internally unique events being produced, but they, they conflict with another cluster or another producer. Yeah, I think I'm going to... Um say the same thing unless we can have some um what is it some place some repository some place for people to register this otherwise if the different sources they do not co cooperate with each other interesting also the idea yeah so how could they how we can ensure they're globally unique i see okay. this is like the same issue as like ip address is is not globally unique because there's subnets and stuff right Okay, so let me ask this question. Um, do you think it's pointless to even get more clarity on this point? Or is it just a matter of finding the right wording to, uh, to correctly define what uniqueness means? I think it's how we can enforce this. If we say it's globally unique, right? I think that's well, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting we use the word global unique anymore. What I'm saying is, is, uh, there, is there the right term? Is there, right, is, there, is there a good wording that we can come up with to, to add some clarification here? Or, if, or, or what I'm wondering is whether trying to add more clarification is actually going to make things worse. And we should just close this issue and not touch it at all. Is the problem that uh, the, there's... Uh, confusion on if a single producer can produce events that conflict with itself? I think the question this was raised because the spec says um, the ID must be unique within the scope of the producer. And there was some questions about, okay, what does that actually mean to be unique? And is it unique within, does that mean it's unique within the scope of some nebulous thing called producer or is it mean that's unique within the scope of this source uh, URI kind of thing, right? How do, they, how do people determine uniqueness? I think that's where this thing came from. And I'm okay with us coming back and saying, hey, we're gonna leave it a little bit vague and, and leave it as is, 
but if you guys think, no, we need some kind of clarity, we just haven't found the right wording yet, then I'll keep noodling on it and, and try to come up with a better language and we can keep going back and forth on it. I just want to know whether I should bother to waste my time on it. I think we should clarify the scope, the unique scope, because that's, I think that's important. Okay. I, I think this is clear for me. <laughs> Opposite end of the spectrum, okay. Um, okay, tell you what, since um, we're running out of time, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead, sorry. Um, so one thing, we, maybe we could put the type, the event type into it, because the event type uh, should be prefixed with a reverse DNS name. So at least that part should be really globally unique, because only one person can register a uh, DNS name, right? So if we put that into it, and then people have to make sure their sources are unique in a way. So if I'm, I don't know, I have an open source project and everybody can deploy it, but then I should, as the open source project provider, I should make sure that each source somehow uses something that makes them unique. Does it make okay. sense what I'm saying? I, I understand so, what so you're if, saying. If, yeah. So yeah, let, let, let's let say, um, Let's say I, um, I don't know, Apache Kafka, and I, for some reason, I produce events, and that is deployed up until many places. But then, the, then each user of my open source project must then make sure their source is unique because source can be a URI reference. So I don't know when uh, maybe uh, Kafka would have slash message slash ID, so that wouldn't make it unique if I have two different deployments of it, right? if my IDs start counting at one. So then that is not a good source. So then what Kafka should do is they should force, or maybe Kafka is a bit of they should force people to use a uh, full URL again. So another a relative URL, and then it should again be globally unique because then the type isn't unique, but the sources, and then the ID would also be unique. Right. Does that okay. make sense? So I'm gonna have to, call time here just because I want to be respectful of people's running off to other meetings and stuff. I think I got enough information for me to just try to come up with another proposal and see what people think. Um, but I do think it's going to require a little bit of, of wordsmithing. But with that, let me just do the roll call last, last round before we adjourn. And uh, keep in mind, we do have a, um, a phone call after this for the, the, uh, the KubeCon sessions. Uh, Fabio, are you on the call? What about William? Yep, I'm here. Okay, thank you. David Baldwin? Yes, sir. And Klaus? Yes. Jude? Yeah. Okay, Vladimir pinged me offline, so he's definitely here. Uh, Doug, are you there? Doug, did we lose you? Hey, um, okay, he has, he has mic issues. Uh, Fabio, are you there? Okay, did I miss anybody? Okay, thank you guys very much. And we'll, we'll continue the discussion next week. Um, for those of you for the KubeCon sessions, please stay on the line. Uh, I'll, drop, Doug, Doug, I'll drop off uh, and I hope they'll come back before you all, all leave. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Clemens. Okay, thank you guys. We'll talk again next week. Thank you. Bye. All right, let's see. Where are we? Doo -doo -doo -doo. You guys, give me just a sec, guys, to get myself organized here. All right, let's see. Ah, da -da -da -da. Scott, I see you there. Chad, Jude. Actually, it looks like Doug is half, <laughs> it's weird. There's no mic, or actually, is it? sorry. Oh, I need to scroll, okay. So Doug might still be there. And, room. I'll BRB. What? Say that again? I will BRB. You'll BRB. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> uh, who's it? 
I don't think that's John Mitchell. Uh, I don't know if that is me, but I'm still here. Yeah, I know. I got, I got, I got you, Christoph. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Jude, you have your hand up? Um, does CN con mean cloud native con? Yeah, we're talking about this. This is planning for uh, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con in where is it, Barcelona? Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just looking for the uh, the full form of CN con. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the URL handy. All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Let's see where we're. Yeah, you you misspelled my name, but that's okay. Oh, sorry. No worries. Thank you. All right. Um, oh crap! That's the wrong button. All right. Um, let's see where were we? So, um, so Dan Barker pinged me offline. He's probably not going to be able to make the call today, but he said he was definitely interested in possibly talking about the who are we, why are we here, that kind of stuff. Um, is there any objection? Does anybody else have a really strong desire to cover that part? Otherwise, I was going to give it to Dan. I'm sorry, not Chad. Good God. <laughs> Dan, not Chad. Okay. Not hear anything. Um, okay, so uh, didn't have anything formal planned here other than we just need to get more, more clear on what we're going to be talking about here. Has anybody had any more thoughts in terms of how to solidify all these different topics we brought up last time? So for example, Scott, you were talking about doing a hello world sample in the intro. Um, have you got any more thoughts of that in terms of how you can, how you see that looking or what you want to talk about relative to that? Yeah, I've been kind of, I've been building up clients around the Go SDK in kind of this idea of make it uh, as little as code as possible to start sending events. Okay. Now, are you th but in terms of what you want to actually showcase there, I mean, obviously you can use something like the Go SDK as a sample of saying, hey, look at all the great work we're doing around SDKs and look, is your life really, really easy to use this stuff? Um, but were you thinking about some sort of hello world like live demo to showcase these things and therefore we need to get the other SDK folks involved to make sure that their stuff can participate in that? Yeah, I think that's an open question. I know a lot of languages, but not everyone. <laughs> so. uh, but it, but you do want to, it sounds like you do want to do perhaps some sort of demo there leveraging the SDKs, right? Yeah, I was thinking like a live typey thing if we have time for it. Okay. Do you see this leveraging the same demo code that we're talking about in the other phone call? Or do you think this is... No, I think in the intro, it's just like, if you would like to... Um, add sending uh, cloud events into your existing code. This is the, here's a little code snippet to show you how to get started. Okay. okay. And then like, maybe this is what it looks like on the receiving side to receive a cloud event. Okay. It's, a, it's like active integration. Okay. I have returned. Howdy. Hello. My, my boss had, had, has a crisis, which is great for us. That's <laughs> good for him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. There was a term you used there I like. What was that? It, active integration? Was that the phrase you used? Uh, uh, no. I, don't, I don't remember. I didn't look at the recording. <laughs> Darn. It was, it was a catchy little phrase. I liked it. I think it was like active integration. Because I, I interpreted that as potentially a live coding session almost to add it to, a, to an existing uh, piece of code. Show it in, in. I mean, yeah, that's that's an option. Yeah, we could show the some like something and then uh, slap in some cloud event sending instead, kind of Kelsey Hightower ish. Yeah. Like, look, your life's super hard, but yep. check this out. Yep. Okay, I think that sounds good. So we didn't. We also talked about tips and best practices. Now we have thirty-five minutes. If you assume Dan and this stuff is going to take somewhere between 10 to 15, because this is also going to include, you know, what's new since the last time we talked to these people. So that could be, uh, you know, somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes. Scott, that would leave, what is that, 20 minutes or so left for this stuff. How long do you think you need? Because um, what I'm wondering is whether 
we have time for best practices um, or our tease of the bigger demo or whether we say, no, that's going to be press for time. We need to push it out to the deep dive. I, we might not have any tips yet. <laughs> that is true too. Um, so, okay, let me poke on this because I, I can't remember who, who asked or who mentioned the idea of the tips. Um, it was me. Okay, it was you. Good. Um, were you thinking of tips of, of gotchas relative to cloud events in general or tips relative to using SDKs or something different? I, I guess, you know, there's like the general tip of uh, potentially you, your data is not the, the actual content of the data, but uh, like if an image is uploaded to a bucket, the event doesn't have the image embedded in it. It's the, a ref back to the bucket that had the image dropped in it, for example. Like those kinds of tips, just like noob eventing tips. Got it. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like maybe we need to wait a little bit to sort of brainstorm a little what those ideas might be. And if it's a long list, then maybe we don't have time in the intro. But if it's a short list, maybe we do have time to mention it in the intro, right? So we can wait on that, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it could be like a, a one minute. Oh, by the way, if you if you're looking for like big best practices for eventing, here's our thoughts. It's like a slide of like yeah. several. Well, well, I was gonna say technically we have the primer, which we already do have some. Uh, it's it's a mixture of things in the primer, right? Some of it is explaining the rationale for some of our design decisions, but I think there are some guidance things in there. I think I need to go back and double check what they might be, but I have this vague recollection we have at least one or two things in there for guidance. Okay. Great, yeah. So that might be something to pull from, so. Um, yep. Okay. And we definitely need to add more. I think, for example, I think somewhere on Clevin's long to-do list, he has uh, at least one thing to add to the primer relative to this stuff, too. So whatever, whatever that thing was, we can add that to the list. I just can't remember what it is offhand. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, and I guess the same thing applies then to the potential demo, right? It depends on whether we have time or not to sort of give a tease for the deeper dive session demo. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's focus on the deep dive then. Um, -dum -bum -bum -bum. I'm trying to remember, were we thinking of two separate demos here or do we think the hello world would be? No, because the hello world is definitely not the, the factory thing you're talking about. So are we thinking actually doing two different demos here? Yes. Yeah, I think that's the, that was the plan. It was drop down in the code a couple times. Well, I don't think you're going to really show code for the demo. You, you might show some like, so leveraging what we just did with the, the simple version, we rewrote a complex version and, and here's the rigmarole of how it operates and flow okay. through. Okay. So taking, taking the hello world from the previous, from the intro and adding something like trace ID to it. Oh, oh, for for the uh, live coding sessions, I don't know. It could. I don't think it has to be the same. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, Vlad isn't on the call. To talk about this one. Okay, sign Vlad up for a whole bunch of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. What about this section here? Is there somebody on the call who would like to take lead on either at least flushing this out and or potentially presenting lessons learned? That's kind of my topic, isn't it? I was wondering if you're gonna volunteer, yes. <laughs> ah! <laughs> We're all waiting for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I can, I, I can, I can do that. Having. Having uh, contents in the having content in this uh, would be for helpful, I think. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to possibly toss their name into the hat on this one? Okay. Not hearing any. Um, I'm assuming then that between Vlad doing something interesting here, Clemens with his talk on this stuff we probably won't have uh, a whole lot of time for anything else beyond potentially a showcase of the demo, which is the factory stuff that, that Scott's taking the lead on trying to form or to, to, to flesh out. So I think between these three topics, we should definitely be able to fill up the 35 minutes. Um, so technically this one would be all right. And are we assuming Vlad is taking the lead on this one? Is, or is there somebody else on the call who would like to take lead on it? 
or should I dump it all on Vlad? Uh, can you do me a favor? And because I don't see your screen, uh, roughly say what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot that you're on this train. Yes, I'm talking about um, in a deep dive session, we have a bullet on there that says another hello world example, but with extensions. And if, for example, trace ID. Yeah. And Vlad had a suggestion of, of his deployment pipeline uh, application that he has that he's been working on. So the point of this one was okay. to, to showcase extensions as well. Okay. 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 So is there anybody else who'd like to sort of put their name in the hat uh, or name of the ring on that one, or is, is it okay uh, for me to try to see if Vlad wants to take the lead on that? I think he did want to take the lead on that. Okay, not hearing anything. So what I think we have now is in the intro, Dan would do the who are we kind of thing. Scott would then talk about uh, the SDKs, live sample, hello world type thing. Um, whether we do best practices or not would be based upon whether we can come up with a good list. And if we have time, we'll have to see whether we can do something with a tease for the demo thing there. Oh, Jude, your hand's up. Yeah, sorry. The deep dive is about 35 minutes long, right? If I recall correctly? Correct. They're both 35 minutes, yes. Right. So wouldn't the demo itself take about 20 minutes to kind of explain? Like given all that we're doing in the demo, wouldn't it be like a large piece of the deep dive? I don't know. Uh, I, I could say going either way, because obviously you could probably spend a lot of time doing it, but if you don't necessarily go into the two level, two, uh, two deep detail, you, you could probably summarize what the demo is doing in like two or three minutes and then spend the rest of the time just showing it in action. I don't know, okay. Scott, what, since, you're, since you're taking the lead on this one, Scott, what, what do you think? Yeah, I would, I would think that the, the longer explanation for what's happening in the demo would be um, in a repo somewhere so that people could go and peruse it at their leisure. Okay. Yeah, because I don't think that I don't think showing the demo should necessarily be too technical in terms of getting under the covers. It's more showing how cloud events can be used in more of a real world scenario. And maybe as part of running the demo, we can show the cloud events flowing between the systems. You know, by clicking on a on a button or something, you can actually see the cloud event that got sent between the the factory mm -hmm. and the and the delivery system kind of stuff. But I don't think we have to go too deep under the covers of how that actually worked within the component itself. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully this would be something useful for somebody else that's stumbling upon and trying to learn about cloud events could check out and see maybe not it running live, but understanding how pieces can assemble together. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. okay cool. Thank you for the question though. Um, okay. So we got that. We'll figure out if, if we do decide to do the best practice and tips and a, and, a tease of the bigger demo, then we'll figure out who wants to do that, or we'll just dump it on Scott since he's up on stage at that point anyway. We'll figure that out later. Um, and then deep dive, we got Vlad for the Hello World with extensions, Clemens for the deep dive, and then everybody involved in the bigger demo for the factory thing. Um, does that sound right to everybody so far? Any changes people want to make? Good. Okay. And then for the serverless session, assuming we do get the 80 minute one, which we should be able to do. Um, uh, actually, somebody, some, no, wait a minute, I'm sorry, Dan pinged me, he said, doo -doo -doo -doo. oh, okay, yeah, so Dan um, mentioned to me that he didn't, that he was also not just interested in the who are we kind of thing, but he was also volunteering to potentially help us with the updates of our documentation from the serverless working group, meaning the white paper and the landscape doc, if we need to. So Dan was volunteering to help there. Okay, just want to get that in there. Um, but so anyway, we're talking about the state of serverless, which is obviously related to what's changed in the community recently, and then turn it into a birds of a feather session with the community telling us what they want to do or what, we, what they want us to do. Is there anything else here you guys want to add to that list? Uh, Christoph, I think you're off mute. You want to mention something? Yeah, I, um, I sent you an email. I hope you would give me some feedback if it's uh, <laughs> only about, uh uh, one topic that is of interest to me, I don't know if it's of interest to anyone else, but it's because I'm basically working at a software as a service company. And before, like, if you look at function as a service in one way, it's kind of, it replaces, let's say, virtual machines or containers in, in one view. So you would expect that all the big cloud providers, they offer function as a service, and they do. 
But interestingly, now there are many, many more function as a service providers. So we see people like Cloudflare um, doing it, or and Adobe. But we also see um, other really focused stuff as services or platforms bringing their own function as a service, like Twilio, of Zero, Braintree from PayPal released it last or or two weeks ago. Um, so what's really interesting now is that even if you choose a single cloud provider and then you choose a few external services, you may end up with a couple of function as a services that you actually use. And that's not something you would have seen before. So I think that is really interesting and it also makes um, the serverless landscape different um, than containers because like I, I um, of zero or Twilio, you wouldn't expect that they host containers, right? But they host functions. Um, so we could kind of state that, talk a little bit about it. We can talk a little bit about what the challenges are probably going to be, like how do you understand your whole system? How do you keep uh, metrics, alerts, like blogging, um, right? And then turn that into a question for the Birds of Peter session. Because I also think there is potential to have a somewhat standardization because my, I, I was never in a position to do that, but I guess once you have like three, four, five different function as a services that you have to deploy to and that you have to code with, that will get kind of messy if they're all different in the implementation details. So that's a topic that I can offer and then, um, right, that can be extended in talking about serverless or function as services as a whole. Okay, I'm just trying to take some notes here, try to write down what your your ideas there. Um, go on that. Uh, so I want to make sure I got this right, though, because it sounded interesting. So it it sounds like you you wanted to potentially offer some advice on managing the the, the functions themselves and and how when you start managing lots of them the role of standards may become more important to you because then you get commonality across them and you don't have to treat each one separately. Is that, am I summarizing that right? Well, I basically asked that as an open question. Um, so um, how would I say that? So right now, for example, off zero, they offer their own function as a service and it's really tuned towards their API. So which makes sense in some ways, but then it comes with, I mean, so the question is how much can you standardize maybe, but at least around deployment and so on, you could standardize a lot. So yeah. for me, it's an open question because I look, I mean, I kind of did the market analysis to understand what we should do. I kind of came to the con conclusion that, I would say that if every, so, I mean, like in this enterprise case where you buy five, 10, 15 different services and then merge them all together. And then if you have everyone brings their own function as a service, you end up in a really strange place. That was my gut feeling. But everyone else thinks it's fine <laughs> to set up their own function as a service. So, for me, it's an open question. Right. I, personally, I, I, I think that's a really interesting topic to bring up, if nothing else just to get the ball rolling in terms of a discussion with the community to see what their experience is. Because uh, people may not, people may think that they're the only ones experiencing these problems and it might be nice to hear that other people are, are having the same kind of issues and that may then lead to people saying, hey, let's do something about this. Yeah, that will be my hope as well. Yeah, interesting, okay, I like that idea, okay. I mean, Anything you else? can also approach it from the other side, from the uh, software as a service platforms, because for them, it is really, really hard to, and that's kind of what I try to do. It's really, really hard to reuse the function as a services that are provided by the cloud vendors, because everyone brings their own interface. And so if you want to integrate with three, five, 10 different cloud providers that your customers have, there's much more trouble for you as a software as a service provider um, than just going setting up your own. So the standardization could also happen on the other side, like we sort of do with cloud events now. Yep, yeah. that makes sense. But, okay, yeah. 
Anybody else have anything they want to mention relative to the longer serverless working group session? Do you, Doug, do you envision someone opening up with say 15 or 20 minutes so that state of, you know, how do you make sense of all this serverless stuff and then opening up to a birds of feather conversation? Is that what's in your mind? I think so. Yeah. I think I was hoping at some point someone would volunteer to say, okay, I'll summarize where, where the working group thinks the state of serverless has has evolved too since the last time we since we produced the paper and and talk about potentially what changes uh, we we've, we've made to the white paper and landscape doc assuming we have made any or maybe we haven't and they just talk about in general where the industry has changed from our point of view and then yes turn it into a birds of a feather interactive discussion with the community if that makes sense to you guys. Hey Doug, I'd, I'd also be interested in trying to help uh, update the doc. Uh, okay. Cool. Was there somebody, uh, Chad, were you asking because this is something that you'd like to sort of lead the discussion on in terms of the state of the environment? You know, I could, yeah. My attendance at KubeCon is very up in the air at the moment. Okay, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I can't commit at this time, but. Okay, I'll put your name there down tentatively. Okay. So thank you. Actually, it sounds like uh, Data serverless, and obviously, since Christoph, with your ideas there, you you probably have a, a hand in that, uh, at least relative to the discussion starting section with the community folks um, to start prompting those ideas uh, for discussions. Uh, Jude, your hands up. Yeah, uh, this I don't know if this is off topic or or on topic, but I'm gonna just put it out there. Uh, so, for example, where I worked last. Uh, we did like um, like an AWS Lambda versus like the serverless, like the AWS functions versus um, our own server, like a like a stateful server, stateless like a microservice. And in terms of cost, the the mic microservice hosting like like a like a service is much more cost effective than using a AWS Lambda. Uh, I don't know if this works as like you know. Um, like a use case or like an example or something like that. Hmm. Like it's more cost effective, at least on the AWS to kind of not use like serverless lambdas, but to kind of host your own service, um, that's much more effective. <laughs> Lots of hot nuances to that debate. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I, I think, if you if it turns into a discussion of the charging model for AWS, that's probably not a good topic. But I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is, is there a discussion there that says, uh, you know, everybody talks about serverless as being more cost effective. However, there are some use cases where it actually may not be more cost effective. So you don't have to mention AWS specifically, but you could say in general, you know, but when, when you're doing this particular type of deployment or type of application, maybe serverless isn't the most effective because of X, Y, and Z. That might be yeah. an interesting discussion, yes. Yes, yeah, so serverless, so what we found out is uh, serverless, when you kind of go to scale, and when I mean scale of like say, processing like say millions of requests per second, um, serverless does not, is not really cost effective. Serverless is kind of cost effective only when you're handling a uh, request where it's like, you know, thousands per hour, uh, but when it, when like the, your scale kind of increases really large, then um, serverless does not get effective at all. It's in fact more. I mean, well, it's now more now you now you make you're not making an architectural statement. You're making a. I'm thinking of a vendor and their pricing model statement. Uh, because and, because because I can very much imagine a platform which can give you, uh, you know, a million events per second and g gives gives them to you cheap. Okay, um, so I don't know. So we evaluated kind of AWS and- uh, Yeah, see, that's, but that's the point. The, the, you, you have evaluated existing products, but it's not an architectural statement. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that, we gotta be very careful there, right? Because we don't wanna pick on anybody in particular. But if, if, if we do think that, as Clement said, if there are architectural thing, lessons learned, uh, that, that would be useful, as long as we're not focusing on one particular vendor to do it. Because, because what, whatever the pricing model is, is what people can get. Um, ultimately, that's how the price is determined. Um, but that is no, that's not 
truly an architectural concern. The, the better the infrastructures get and the more com competition lam Lambda gets, um, the cheaper stuff is going to get and it's always that way. But that doesn't change the, f the, tru the truth of the architecture. Of course, yeah. I was just mentioning this from like a current state of uh, how, it, how like it's priced across windows. Yeah. But if, if you can find, I, I do think the, the, the general topic is probably a good one to bring up because I think the, the entire question of when to use serverless versus PaaS versus containers of service, I think from my personal experience, I think there is still some confusion in the industry in terms of people knowing when to choose what or do they even need to think about it, right? You know, with something like Knative, the line between all three of those are very, very blurred to me as an example, right? So does it really matter what you call it? You're just using this piece of technology to host something, right? Um, but I think, I think people are looking for some sort of guidance here. And if we can think of something to say in this space um, to help to help make them feel more comfortable with their decision making, I think that would be good. I just don't want to pick on AWS or any other vendor to make it happen. I agree. So which kind of use cases are appropriate for serverless versus like, you know, a pass and, and so on. Right. And I, what's interesting is we did talk about this in the white paper already. And so I don't want to, I don't think it needs to be right for us to necessarily repeat everything we mentioned in the white paper, but if we could sit there and say, you know, the white paper gave some high level guidance on when to use all these things, but in practice, this is what we found out or our experience has, has, given us validation for the way putting the white paper is correct, right? So if we could talk about our experience in general from an architectural perspective about when to do these things, I think that'd be very useful. And then that could get a discussion going with the broader audience. Yeah, and this might also be touching upon a broader topic of what are the use cases for serverless. It always comes up, I and mean, people always ask me, what, what can you use serverless for? And, and my answer is always, it's just code. There's a million things you can do, but I'd love to hear from the community what people are actually doing and have people talk about their experiences uh, to, as a way to sort of share what's possible with serverless and where to get started. Yep. Just taking some notes here. These are all good things. So I'd say at some point what we should probably do is if, if nothing else, just come up with the sort of a list of these questions that we want to sort of throw out to the audience and see what their experience is. And if no one answers it, then, you know, obviously one of us can share our experience with it um, just to get the ball rolling. But yeah, having a list of questions for the BOF would be good. And I think we're starting to get a good list here already. So this is all good stuff. So, so there's that side breakout serverless conference next to KubeCon. Well, I don't understand the exact timing of that, that event. I don't know either. Because the last I've seen is they have that document that sort of lays out the general idea and they talk about some sort of committee doing it. But I haven't heard about the next steps. Um, if you want, I'll take the AI to go ping uh, Chris Anacek to see what's going on with that thing. Yeah, it would just be real sad if like the birds of a feather session got scheduled the, the last day, which conflicted with the serverless summit as a breakout uh, conference. Yeah. Okay, I'll take the AI to ping Chris and find out what is up with that. Okay, we will do. Okay. Or like, it, should I stay an extra day and, and join that too? Because that, that'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember. Did that document even say what day it was going to be or just that they want to do it during the conference at some point? I think they just wanted to do it, but they want to do a whole day, which doesn't make sense if you're traveling for KubeCon and then you're being asked to divert to a different conference. Yeah. So. Okay. I'll ask them to see if they have any more details and things like um, you know, which day after before kind of thing. Okay. Um, topics. Yeah, because if it's a direct overlap, well, that's the other thing. It's not clear to me, for example, whether it's going to be just sessions where people give talks, just like it's a KubeCon kind of a conference, or whether this is meant to be more of an interactive discussion among the community, like a gigantic BOF. Because if it's a gigantic BOF, then are they duplicating what we're doing? It's exactly. Right. And so, if that's the case, CNCF serverless work group should definitely attend in some fashion. Right. Okay. Um, uh, I totally got these things mixed up, actually. <laughs> I like merged them in my head, I think. Oh, uh, yeah, it's a good thing we're bringing it up, though. So thank you, Scott. Sessions or more BOF like. Okay, I'll try to get more information on that. All right. Uh, okay. 
anything else relative to any of the sessions you guys want to talk about? Because I have a feeling right now we're kind of at the point now where anybody whose names are signed up to these things, they need to sort of take the next step, possibly fleshing it out or starting Flesh. to get Flesh. fleshing, fleshing it out. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, fleshing it out. Um, and, uh, and taking the next round of something relative to it to make it more, a little more real. Um, you guys think we need to meet again next week or I'm, I'm leaning a little bit towards waiting a little while because it's not till May. I think the only thing that may require a little bit of work uh, relatively soon is do, 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 potentially updating our landscape and dock. Where is that hosted? It's on the service working groups GitHub repo. Okay, thank you. Um, is there somebody on the call who wants to take a first pass at looking at what's there to see whether they think something needs to be updated? Not asking you to necessarily update it, but thinking whether there's something or doing the analysis to see if something maybe needs to be updated. Because two names were mentioned. <laughs> what, what, what? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I need to go read it again and okay. uh, see if it still resonates or if it's like out of date. Okay, I'll tell you what, why don't you do this? I'll, I'll poke Dan as well since he, he volunteered completely on his own to, to say he wants to help there. So between you and Dan, maybe you guys could take a look at it and see whether you think something needs to be done in that space. Um, and if so, uh, we could then figure out how to make that happen. Not, saying, not necessarily saying it's you guys, but just we'll figure out who does the work then. Yeah, is that um, Mr. Barker? Yeah, Dan Barker, yeah. Okay. Um, so what do you guys think about maybe not meeting next week, but maybe in two weeks? Yeah, sounds or, good. Yeah. Does anybody think we need to meet sooner than that for any reason? Okay, I'm not hearing it. Okay, so same time, same place, after normal call in two weeks. Okay. Anything else you guys want to talk about? Anything we're forgetting? All right. In that case, I think we're done. Oh, good. Cool. Thank you guys very much. I think we made some progress here. Yes. And, and Doug, I will promise that tomorrow I will do a lot of homework. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> All just, right. Just for you. All right. Thank you. I like that. Okay. Bye. Thanks, guys. All right. Okay, later. Later. We'll talk later. Bye, guys. All right.